The Influencer's Edge is brought to you by the Rapid Sales Accelerator. If you're ready to skyrocket your sales by 30% or more in just 90 days, then you need to claim your free training right now. You'll learn four words that will compel your prospects to trust you like they were children within the first three to five minutes of any conversation across any platform and any medium. You'll learn how to give your prospects objection amnesia to crush objections like I need to talk to my spouse or I need more time to think it over or it's too expensive. If you'd like to claim your free training now, go to www.paulrossbook.com. Do it before your competition does it now. Welcome to the Influencer's Edge. This is the place where you come to get the latest breakthroughs cutting edge insights, tools, and techniques to leapfrog over the pack in sales, persuasion, and influence. Be sure you visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now sit back, tune in, and enjoy today's episode. Okay, welcome to the Influencers Edge I was telling my guests before we went on the air that this is going to be one of the most fun shows he's ever done. Our guest is uh, Ethan. Can you pronounce your last name for, for me? Cassiotis. Cassiotis. It's a nice Jewish name, isn't it? <laughs> Greek background, actually, but close. <laughs> I know. I'm kidding. So you are, his podcast, ladies and gentlemen, is so intricate i don't know if i can go through the whole thing and not take 10 minutes because he's a very accomplished man but ethan is a business growth expert what does that mean a business growth expert helping uh businesses grow and scale an expert in that okay investor uh so you bought bitcoin when it was a dollar a coin or what <laughs> no i invest in businesses that's what i what enjoy more invest so. in businesses okay international speaker Coach, mentor, consultant, podcast host. Ethan, when do you find time to sleep? Do you do you sleep? <laughs> uh, you know, I like doing a few different things. It keeps it interesting for me. Okay, me too. He helps business owners grow and scale their businesses, create wealth and freedom. You know, someone told me once when I did uh, interviewed them, they said, as you scale, your problems get bigger too. Have you found that to be the case? Like if you take a business from seven to eight figures or from single eight figures to multiple eight figures, do you prepare them for the problems that come up? And what do you find to be the problems that come up when you do reach those levels of success? Yeah, definitely. A lot of things have to change. Like for example, their systems that they already put in previously may need to change to be able to scale effectively. And a lot of the time it's obviously the people, right? When you grow a business, you need people to do that. So the leadership styles, when it's a smaller business, maybe you've got the direct reports just reporting to you as the founder. Um, if you're, you know, obviously still working in the business, but later on, you may need to get, you know, managers down the line and you're not directly managing everybody. So to be able to make that culture happen and make sure it goes down the line without your direct input to all the main stakeholders starts to become, you know, more challenging. So there's a lot of different elements of, yeah, making sure that the vision, the culture, all of that goes through the organization and what needs to change at that level to really get that exponential growth and do it without having cash flow problems, you know, without people leaving, all of those things that could potentially happen to, to draw the business down. You mentioned business culture and systems. So is that something I could see how someone of, you, uh, of your capability could help them scale through helping them change their marketing and, and all sorts of other things. But do you also assist in the logistics of scaling and creating the corporate culture? Is that not your game? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, you know, even though I dropped out of high school, I went back to do an MBA and I sort of incorporate a lot of different things. Right. So I've got a bit of a unconventional route. So I, I focus, I'm also an NLP master practitioner. I know you're big on, on, on that side of things as well. So yeah, I've I have been the helping with, Nel I've been helping with Nelpin since 1988. Amazing, mate. Um, you know, that, that's that's uh, just after I was born, funnily enough. So uh, oh, God. I've been doing Thanks. it for a long time. 
And, <laughs> well, and that was a great episode of the Influencer's Edge. Join us next week when we will bring Milton Erickson back from the dead. <laughs> no, that's it. No, you've definitely, uh, you know, got, you know, decades there, right, of experience, mate. So you're, you're definitely a master in it. So I, I focus, uh, there's some mindset elements because they may need to change some strategy and planning, those foundational parts. Then I also focus on the branding, marketing, and sales elements in that deal phase. And then we focus on the delivery phase around your numbers, your systems, and your leadership. So I, I cover all of those areas, you know, in what I do. And then think of me like a GP doctor right that knows all these areas and can help you but then we can bring in the specialists if required right if we need to you know implement something specifically as well i like that metaphor did you think when you were a kid of going to medical school and being a doctor i didn't but uh i thought of that going how can i specify it um i think probably parents want you to be a doctor or a dentist or something like that but that wasn't the route for me hey see this i'm jewish everyone wants their son to be a doctor or a lawyer <laughs> I can make that joke because I'm one of them. You have helped thousands of businesses in over 30 industries across 10 countries. You host the Business Growth Show. I understand you had a genius guest by the name of Paul Ross. I'm sure he was one of your most popular guests. And then you've had Definitely. little people like uh, Jay Abraham. Who the fuck is Jay Abraham? I uh, I don't know who that Maybe is. Just the highest paid mark in the world. You know, just someone small. I know, Jay. I, I knew him in the 90s uh, when he lived in Rancho Palos Verdes. He wanted me to work on a project with him, but I, I can't tell you what it is to this day. Bruce Buffer, let's get ready to make money. What? And if you have an NDA, I understand. But if you don't have an NDA, can you give me a general idea of what you did for Bruce? Bruce? Well, yeah, interviewed Bruce and I even got an intro from him. Obviously, he's the UFC um, you know, announcer. So I got an intro for him before going on stage. And we just talked a lot about branding and marketing because what a lot of people don't know about Bruce. So Michael Buffer is his brother, the Let's Get Ready to Rumble right. guy. And right. then Bruce is It's Time, right? Which which is the UFC. Oh, see, I got it confused. Right? But Bruce was actually the smarts behind Michael Buffer and his licensing and all of that bruce was actually the smarts behind it and then now he's actually you know doing so much more with his brand with all these different products and things that bruce is doing so he's really a very smart business guy uh bruce when you chat to him great guy as well really really sharp jillian jillian michaels is that right yes i know she's the, the fitness coach i remember her when she was uh doing radio zoo time Morning Zoo Radio. Nick Bell, George Kukas, Kukas, who's George? How do you say it? Yeah, George Kukas. Yes, uh, he he founded a bankrupt company. Uh, he bought a bankrupt company for a million dollars. Took it public five years later for one point four billion. It's worth over. Ah, uh, you billion. know, he needs to get up off his lazy ass and make some enemies. <laughs> <life. laughs> I'm making some enemies here. You personally worked with many of Australia's biggest brands, including Kmart, Target. Westfield, they're not doing so well in some parts of the U.S. Catch Coles, Department of Defense. Okay, so you have a security clearance? Yeah, well, I don't actually go to the site specifically. I'm more looking at the data outside of it uh, right. on that side. But I'm making I know sure you that... know where the aliens are, Ethan. <laughs> you need to spill the tea. That's it. We don't have Roswell, unfortunately, in Australia, but a little bit different over here. <laughs> All right. You have an MBA majoring in strategic management and entrepreneurship. That does not surprise me. And is a master NLP practitioner coach. Who did you get your training with? Just out of curiosity. Uh, mine was in here in Australia, a guy called Tony Kay, um, who um, I think he learned through the Tad James um, side of things. Oh, yeah. I can tell you, I'll tell you a story about Tad off the air. Okay. Cool. All right. So this is, this is so broad. Let's talk about personal branding. So improving your personal branding for doing deals. Everyone focuses on branding, talks about branding, branding this, branding that. Everyone's looking to find the next Nike swoosh symbol. So I understand branding for a major corporation. I really get it. Like uh, the insurance companies who advertise here in the U.S., they've got their spokesperson who's like a character that they're a fictional character who everyone can identify with rather than an insurance company, which is a monolithic, blood-sucking, monstrous financial institution. So how does branding apply to, say, someone who's doing 
seven figures and has a small team instead of uh, a multi-billion dollar corporation with a thousand employees. Yeah. So branding, there's, there's two elements, right? We've got business brands and we've got personal brands. And um, side note, my wife has a branding agency, so I'm well versed in ha understanding brands. Now, a lot of people originally just think business brand, right? Like you said, Nike, these things. And the great thing about a brand is that it's an asset, right? It actually has um, a lot of people think, oh, I just want marketing. I want leads. But you need to actually have the brand foundation first because you could be pulling leads into something that just doesn't make sense and people don't want, right? So think about a great analogy one of my coaches said is um, marketing is the engine and branding is the fuel, right, to that engine. So that's how you can ramp it up, right, with, with the branding. So, you know, in a business brand, you can, it, it makes it sellable. It adds value to the brand. Like why do people, if I look at something, a brand in the US, right? Why do people go to Walmart and get a really, you know, cheap something that they want to get right from there compared to going to a more boutique store that, that the, the similar item or a t-shirt, right? Or whatever it is, it may cost twice the price because it has a Nike tick on it, right? It's all brand, even though it might be similar material, right? That they use. So the positioning of the brand allows you to charge more, allows people to connect with it more um, and allows you to play in a different space, right? Depending on how you want to position that brand. And if you talk from the personal branding side, this is where, you know, in the end, you will know this as well, Paul, is that people buy people a lot of the time. They don't buy products and services. So if, if so it's true, <laughs> right? If, if you've got 10 people that do a similar thing to you, that, you know, you've got to connect with them and they're going to be like, I trust Paul the most. I trust Asian the most. You know, I want to work with them more. And that comes down to your personal brand. And we all have a personal brand from our social media. That's a very simple aspect of our personal brand, how we portray ourselves. But then ideally, we want to build that even more. Um, you know, I, I've got my personal brand website or other elements to my personal brand that I bring out. And the benefits of it is number one, you become more of an authority, which is a great thing. That's what you want to do. It allows you to charge more. Also allows you to do multiple businesses. It allows you to attract partners, right? A lot of these bigger things allows me to get big guests and connections into people that I wouldn't potentially get if I didn't build my personal brand as well. So there's a lot of benefits that could, yeah, come from that. It occurs to me just a, a, a intuitive hit to ask a question as I'm absorbing what you're saying. I think it was, if it wasn't Jay Abraham, it was someone of equal stature, uh, Dan Kennedy. You know who Dan Kennedy is, of course. Yes. Dan Kennedy is another OG on par with Jay, if not even more experienced. Dan now is like really up there in years. They have to prop him up and pump liquid into him to keep him going. One of his things is to say, create a persona that that will that takes the people who you don't want as customers and polarizes them so it pushes them away. Do you do you get where, I, where I'm aiming? Now it's not something that everyone can do, but I like the con people who are contrarians. I'll give my money to. I like contrarians, people who will call out the bullshit and the what's not working in their particular industry. Have you helped people who have a contrarian brand? And what would you say to that message that I'm laying out there that sometimes it, excuse me, it helps to be a contrarian? Yeah, definitely. You know, if you want to just please everybody and, and be something to everybody, you're probably going to be uh, something to a lot nobody at the same time, right? So we need to be polarizing to some extent. And the simple way to change the language of that is just be authentic, Right, a lot of people don't necessarily want to show everything about themselves because they're like, "Oh, this person might judge me. I don't know if I want to show this side of me." But when you actually be authentic and you just share everything about your views, yes, you're going to get some haters, right? But at the same time, you're going to get the raving fans, the people that love you because they're like, oh, "I love everything about you know Paul or what he does with this podcast, or whatever," because he just says it how it is, right? In that area there. So as long as you can. Don't worry about the haters or the people that are there because that's fine. You just think about it like, then there's more people that love me. Then you're going to get the people that really want to do business with you because if you play it too safe, then you're not going to get that and you're not going to get as much traction, right? In terms of what you're doing. As I think of it, I don't deliberately, I didn't consciously set out to brand this podcast, but it definitely has a flavor to it, which is, look, I'm wearing my cats and money t-shirt. There's no nice background. I swear, I say, hey, to the audience, if you don't like it, Fuck you, it's my podcast. So people are tuning in for that raw, gritty. I can't believe it, but someone actually showed me the data. I'm, 
we're ranked in the top 10% of podcasts globally. And I don't even freaking market the thing. I think it's just the raw, I don't give a damn what you think persona that is in fact branding, even though you, you don't. So let me ask you this. You don't need a logo in order to brand. That's correct, right? We all have the personal brand. It's just layers of it. Yes, later you could create a logo for your personal brand. You could do all those things as well, but you don't need one. It's just branding is really how people feel and what they say about you. And then, you know, what is that perception, right, of you? And you can control that instead of allowing other people to make that assumption. You can control what, what you want to portray in that brand. And if you're properly branded, you could sell dog shit and make money. Like, okay, Kim Kardashian, yeah. Khloe Kardashian is worth billions. Chloe can put out her own perfume line. I think she's, and the perfume is no better than any other perfume out there. Don't sue me, Chloe. I'm assuming it's not. I'm not an expert in perfume, right? The, for all you know, she'll put out a Chloe Kardashian sanitary pad <laughs> and she'd make money because she's built, she's a celebrity because she's a celebrity. Yeah. So and where I'm driving. It, Definitely. And, and you got to think ahead, right? Like always, I always think strategically when I help my clients, many moves ahead, what could happen? So let's say you've got your business, right? At some point, ideally you want to sell that business, right? Or, you know, to get like a liquidity event, all this hard work that you've done, you're going to make a big return at some point, right? If you do that, if you have no personal brand and you've built it, once you sell that business, you're starting from scratch, right? Because nothing was connected to your name. Whereas if you're building your personal brand at the same time, not only will other opportunities or businesses happen during that process, but once you sell or when you start a new business, a second business, all of a sudden, everything that you've done in that first business is transferred to that one because it's, it's part of what you've achieved in your results. So the second business, everything else you do already has a lot more fuel into what you're doing there. So you want to be building it and think about partnerships. One, one thing my coach has said is that people that want to partner with you want to see that your brand is on the same level as theirs or above theirs. So if you want to partner with big people, the perception of your personal brand needs to be at a certain level because if we want to go to Jay and go, hey, we want to do this big thing with you, if you've got no personal brand, you know, you just got a little bit of a business, he's going to be like, who are you? You don't look like much. But, you know, if you're doing all these big things, maybe you're speaking, you're doing all these other areas that you're doing and he's like, wow, okay, Ethan must be somebody, Paul must be somebody. I'm open, you know, to doing a partnership or something like that or whoever it is from there. I'll tell you a funny story. And I don't want to make this podcast about me. I want my guests to do 95% of the talking. But I've had people in the in, in the marketing and business industry and who I can't mention, NDAs and the rest of it, who have been gobsmacked by my other, you know, my other personality, Ross Jeffries, the king of getting laid, because when they were teenagers, they got laid <laughs> using my stuff. So now... When I call them or send them an email, it's like, holy shit, you're Ross Jeffries. Yeah, I want to talk to you. <laughs> so there's an example of trend. I, I tried to just brand as Paul Ross, but it didn't work because no, the the big people don't care about, like, who the hell is Paul Ross? But everyone knows Ross Jeffries. And my coaches said, stop making it a secret and trumpet it from the rooftops. If you can't fix it, feature it. Let's get into the the nuts and bolts of how you do this. So I'm a business. I come to you. What is your, you're like the brand surgeon, the brand doctor, the brand expert. What would be the process of helping me to begin to build a brand? Would you look at my previous marketing? Would you interview me? What would you do? Yeah. Initially you'd go through like a workshop, right? A strategic workshop where you, you ask, you know, there's a lot of questions, right? This can take up to two hours a lot of the time and really extract things. Now, some of these questions you could probably find, you know, using chat GBT and things like that, right? So it's not rocket science. Some of them are very strategic questions as well, but you can't really do it on yourself, right? Because you need, it's like coaching, right? It's hard to coach yourself. You need somebody else to go, take you through a process and dig deep in things, no matter what that is there. So you take people through a process, you dig deep and you really find what's the essence of that person or that brand and what you're trying to achieve. Because in the end, you want to get a very unique message that is, you know, that you want to do. And then what is everything that is connected to that? So then how we portray that message visually, you know, and out there into the market from that marketing side. You know, a good example with my wife, right? My wife has a branding agency. So I've learned a lot of this from her, but she partners with marketers. Now, a lot of ad agencies, they actually, people go to them directly, say, 
want to run ads, they actually go to her and say, hey, we need you to do the brand messaging work because we know if we just run the ad straight away, they're not going to work because they haven't done these brand foundations. They're just talking about whatever, the same thing as everybody else. Yeah. So it's really pulling that out and creating that uniqueness that is going to really cut through everybody, right? You know, into that market and go, yeah, this is me uh, for those people. Part of, part of my psychology says push back a little bit and I'll tell you why. I think you're, first of all, you're right. You're right in every aspect. I just know that there are people who are part of my audience who are thinking, I'm a direct response marketer. I don't have time for branding. Good direct response marketing doesn't require branding. I can make a lot of money without branding. What would you say to the people who are direct response marketers? And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's someone who creates a video sales letter or writes a even mail hard copy mail is coming back. Snail mail is coming back. What would you say to direct response marketers who say, eh, branding, I don't have time for that. Would you say they're idiots or what's the word in, in Australia? Yeah. Wankstein <laughs> or is it a wanker? Wanker. You could use the word wanker. Yeah, definitely. Um, I love it. So, I would say is like, are, are you really wanting the best for that client, right? So in the end, you want the client to do the best as possible with the marketing, you know, direct response that you're doing. So now some some elements of direct response you can't control like the sales process, right? So do you, I know some good direct response marketers actually help with some sales elements because they know once they give them these leads, they need to convert them, right? So there's an element there of knowing things down the line. But then think about it. If you fix, if you do the brand elements and you do that messaging, imagine like the conversion percentage and the types of quality leads that you're going to be getting from them, right? So the quality leads will be better. They're probably going to get more sale conversions. They're probably going to get a lot more lifetime value because you're getting the real, you're cutting through the noise, yeah. right? With yeah, what you're doing. So then you, your success story is going to be better, right? Instead of getting a 3x return, you could be getting a 10x, 20x return, yep you know, in your client. So if you do that work properly, if you're looking at it from a long-term perspective with that client, they'll want to stay with you longer, all of those, you just need to convince them that that's important. And then maybe partner with some branding people, you know, some salespeople, whatever that is. So you take the whole ecosystem of that deal phase that I talk about, which is branding, marketing, and sales. I'm thinking of the big brands who are teaching the big brands out here in the United States, but you've heard of him, or Gary V. You know who Gary V is. Yep. Alex Hermozoi. You know who Alex Hermozoi is, who's yep. my current favorite. I think he kicks everyone else in the ass. Uh, Brendan Bouchard. Of course, Tony Robbins sits at the top of the shit. He, I mean, the top of the heap. <laughs> Definitely. Russell Brunson's doing a bit as well over there. Yeah, too. Russell's been around a long time. I, yeah, I, yeah. yeah he's, he's been around a long, long time. Yeah. Are there any big celebrity names in the marketing field in Australia that we outside of the down under subcontinent wouldn't know about? Yeah, we do have some bigger speakers in those, those personal brand elements there, right? So I would say that I guess two of the biggest ones would be, um, you know, Aaron Sansoni and Kerwin Ray. I don't know if you've heard of these two guys. Kerwin actually followed Gary V from the start. He was one of the initial guys that went to the US and Gary told him the strategies and he did it and he blew up, you know, to millions of followers and did all these things. So a lot of these guys have learned. I think Aaron learned a lot from Jay as well, um, you know, in the early days. These guys have been around for, you know, 15 plus years, right? That they've been doing it. So, you know, it's a long time that they've built their, their brand. Some of the early guys, they're probably the two of the biggest that I would say in Australia, then you've got, you know, many levels, you know, that go down as well. So I've, I've interviewed both of them. I, you know, I know them, I, I've been in, in, learned from them as well, as well as a lot of people. And I think my, my strategy is, is to learn from as many of these guys, some of them learn from each other, but they've all got their unique elements and you can take stuff from them and, and then create your own flavor. Right. And that's for me to be on their level and above. That's my, my plan to be one of the biggest speakers here in Australia and then the world too. That's well, it certainly hopes to have helps to have lofty, lofty goals and to keep yourself going. According to this, you, you have taught or spoken in 10 different countries. I have clients in 10 different countries that I've helped. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So yeah, they one-on-one uh, -on -one coached them, attended my events and everything like that. So 
you know, it's not just people in Australia, right? Any market, um, you know, so many different types of industries, over 30 industries that I've helped and, um, and all of that. So, cause business is business. A lot of the time, a lot of people say, yeah. oh, maybe I should go just to that specific type of niche and learn from them. The problem is, is you're doing the same thing as everyone else. And there's a thing called conceptual implementation, where if you can take things from other businesses, industries and put into your industry, you could become unique and be different. Goddamn well. right. Goddamn right. I didn't know that term before. Would you rep repeat the term? Conceptual implementation. I love it. Uh, you know, <laughs> never mind. I'll tell you off the air, but I, a, a very successful family member of mine, like who stomps me marketing uh, money wise, everything said, uncle, don't you dare niche. <laughs> don't do it. And she doesn't. And I listen to her. All right. Nice. How to deal with blah, 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 blah. how to deal with big brands is one of the suggested interview questions. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Does that mean if I'm approaching a big brand and I want to do a deal with them, what is 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 that what you mean? Yes. All right. So I'm thinking, how do you even get in the door? Because the gatekeeper is going to be slamming it and slamming it and slamming it. Uh, I think I could get in the door with Jay. Um, no, I'll talk to you about that off the air. So how how do they, what are some of the do's and don'ts of uh, making that happen? Yeah, and, and by big brands in this element, it's a similar with people, but I'm talking more business brands, right? I'm talking, you know, the Nikes, or I've worked with, you know, Kmart right. and Tiger, which are very big here, or Westfield Shopping Centers, which you have over there, or Defense, these types of people, right? Um, where they're, they're very big organizations. Um, so yeah, a lot of the time with big brands, you've got to understand is that, there's a lot of stakeholders in this process and you've got to work out who the right decision maker is or who the gatekeeper is. And it's also a timing thing. So, you know, for example, with me, so it, do they have a, an immediate need? It's when there's more of an immediate need of what you offer that, you know, if there's a problem that needs to be solved, that's all we're doing, right? As entrepreneurs at solving. So one thing that I did in, in the waste management side, my original background is uh, I worked with Westfield. It was my first big client, right? And I, I saved them, you know, over $4 million a year, 20 million over five years with their tender. So their waste management tender. And I knew this only happens every three years that this pops up, right? This is what I mean by timing. And I said, I know that I can provide you a lot of value. Um, you know, and it was about a month before they went out. I just knew roughly when it was, right? And I, all I did was I, I met this lady for five minutes, about four years before that right? And I connected with her on LinkedIn and she was still there, right? In that role. And I just said, okay, she's still, there's still other people that are stakeholders in the process, but she's one of the key people, right? So it's finding out who that person is and then reach out. And I just said, Hey, we met here. She would never have remembered me. I didn't even remember the conversation, right? But I was connected with her at least. That's the main thing. So whether it's an introduction, whether you find them on LinkedIn, whatever, right? Find out a way that you can connect with them and ideally get a meeting with them. I met them in person. And from there, always add value and do it for free, right? That was my, my thing. So I just said to them, let's sign an NDA, give me your documents and I'll come back and I'll give you my recommendations and maybe things that you've missed or that you can, you know, right. everything like that. So it's doing work for free, showing that you will add value to them um, because they're not, they're not just going to deal with you. And then if you do that, that will, should be enough for going, wow, you know your stuff. And you, if you can be strategic in highlighting some gaps that you can help with, they're like, okay, we need you. Because a lot of them do use, you know, consultants or external people, right? To do things in, in those big brands because they don't just hire internally. So then it's about understanding, okay, who else is in that process? Do they have enough, you know, power themselves or do you need to meet any other people? And then is there a more of an immediate need that they can, you can help them as well? This takes a tremendous amount of patience and detective work. You're sort of like Sherlock Holmes looking for the clues. I'm serious. And for you to keep track of a lead, a potential person, and build a relationship over four years, I think people should pause and ask the question, how did you develop that level of tenacity? Uh, it's one thing to have technique. It's one thing to have skill. But that kind of tenacity and patience, where the hell, who, who did you model in your life? To come up with that was there someone in your family or a mentor who demonstrated that or have you always been that way i put that down to sport i played a lot of sport growing up and uh -huh. you know i've won a lot of championships in soccer and tennis and 
I wasn't the most naturally gifted like a Messi, right? You know, that's he's probably the most naturally gifted right. soccer player that's playing, you know, there at the moment in the US. But Ronaldo, you know, it's the big strategy about them both being the best player in the world. Ronaldo was the guy that worked the hardest and built himself, right, into the best or one of the top two players um, in the world. So, you know, that's the way that I would be. I was never the most talented of the team. However, I worked the hardest, I put in the work, and I would become one of the best players in the team, right, in there because of the way that I work. So, I think I would put it down to that in that always improving, always wanting to be better side of things. And then, so for me, like getting people on my podcast, right? These big guys, I've tried for three, four years to get some of these guys asking them five or six times that I've been getting no's, right? But I'm like, I'm getting you. Like I'm getting you. I don't care how I will find it. I will find a way to get in and get you on my podcast, right? Most people will quit after one or two no's of going back and doing that, right? So I would just say is that's a big part of it. And if you can build that in and not like following up every week, right? You do strategically, right. you do it over periods of time. What's a different angle that I can do here? Is there a different person I can go through? And then eventually, if you've got it in your mind that you'll do it, then uh, there's always a way. That's the way that I believe it. So had you not had that sporting career do you think you would be in the place you are now in business no i think it, it was a massive part um you know i i think also the other side of it it's a bit like michael jordan if you've seen the last dance um where he needed like an enemy so a couple of times when i dropped out of high school right i didn't finish school my dad who had three degrees said that i'll never be able to study and one of my teachers said that i'll never be successful right now a lot oh. of people could just you know can you imagine that a 17 year old saying yes. that so you know a lot of people could just be like, ah, oh, go down, go comfortable and not do too much. But to me, with the sporting background, if people say I can't do something, it's like, watch me prove you wrong, right? In that <laughs> way. So I that's what I NLP, did. And I, we call that, uh, what do we call that? A response, what kind of responder? A a counter responder? I forget my NLP jargon. <laughs> I, I haven't been in a seminar, someone else's seminar in 30 years, but Wow. I see, this is what I mean. I like to dig into a guest psychology and figure out, and you had that drive to win at sport naturally. It wasn't, it, it was sort of a, a pushback against people who told you you couldn't do it. Yeah. And, and my dad was, was a big sports player as well. Like he played a lot of different sports. So I, I'd probably have to put some down to my dad because he, he put me through sports and I played a lot. He played with like uh, even in soccer tennis, he did. He played AFL, you know, football here in Australia, Australian rules. He played like cricket with some of the top cricket people. Like he did, he wasn't like professional level, but he did well at a lot of different sports. So I think I've got to be grateful for my dad. And that's the same thing that I want to be doing with my future children, you know, to put them through, through sport. I think, I think sports, I like a team sport like soccer. I like tennis, which is an individual, more mental sport. I think they both have pros in that side and one thing i was i wish i did which i think is very good as well for people is doing a martial art like my wife did it wing chung whatever that is because i think there's a lot of discipline and things wing chun is sticky art. hands yes i know what it is yes so that's what I, i'd be that's what i'd be adding you know to my future children about adding a martial art to the sports side of things as well because i think it just builds you up into a very strong mindset of doing better in life and that can only help you in life as an entrepreneur or whatever you want to achieve Wow. See, I like to dig in. And I told you, I don't know. Has anyone ever asked you that before where that drive comes from? Uh, not specifically like that. Definitely. No. It was the first time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like to be the Sherlock Holmes of it. We have actually reached. Uh, wow. We've gone over, over our time. Cause this has been super fun. Now I'm trying to decide whether I, it, we are taping this or recording this September 9th, I think September 10th. And they are doing the first, and God help us, baby Jesus, only presidential debate. And I'm trying to decide. I have an emergency call into my court-appointed therapist to see whether I should watch it or not. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yes, it's going to be interesting coming up with uh, the the November elections. It's going to yeah, change, I, I think, don't even want to, globally, right, uh, as well. Yeah. Oh, God. I don't even want to go into it. All right. Nah, that's, yeah. So stay our guest, uh, thank you, Ethan, and stay on with me for a little green green room chat. Another great guest on the Influencer's Edge. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much. Bye it's now. been a pleasure. The Influencer's Edge is brought to you by the Rapid Sales Accelerator. If you're ready to skyrocket your sales by 30% or more in just 90 days, then you need to claim your free training right now. You'll learn four words 
that will compel your prospects to trust you like they were children within the first three to five minutes of any conversation across any platform and any medium. You'll learn how to give your prospects objection amnesia to crush objections like I need to talk to my spouse or I need more time to think it over or it's too expensive. If you'd like to claim your free training now, go to www.paulrossbook.com. Do it before your competition does it now. Thank you for tuning in to the Influencer's Edge, where you get the latest breakthroughs, cutting edge insights, tools, and techniques so you can leapfrog over the pack at sales, influence, and persuasion. Remember to visit our website at www.theinfluencersedge.com to enjoy even more great episodes like this one. We look forward to seeing you again on the Influencer's Edge Show.